Great Sunday morning. It's Pastor Paul L. Anderson here at the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship, where we believe God's blessings never stop flowing. I, it's the last Sunday in January. It's so hard to believe. We thank God for the wonderful ways he has blessed us this year thus far, how he's allowed us to be with each other as we have virtually shared this time together. I hope it means a lot to you. It means a lot to me. And I do hope and pray that you have been benefiting by this time. So we'd like for you to continue to share it, continue to like it, continue to follow us as we tell others about the goodness of the Lord. I want to invite you to come on. Let's pray together as we talk to God. Gracious God, we invite you to be in our midst today even the more. May your word resonate deep down within our hearts and in our minds and our spirits and give us something that we can go away from here on this day and to say a change has been made in our lives because you've spoken to us. So have your way and it's in Jesus name we begin to say thank you for all that you're doing. Amen. As we continue to tell God, thank you for all the things that he has done for us this year and how he gives us opportunities to share with others. I want to challenge you as I challenge myself. Let's always be the difference that can be made in the situation or the circumstance that we're in. You know, Jesus always made a difference in every place that he was. And he calls us to follow behind him and to do the same that he did. That is make a difference. Today, I'd like to read with you a passage of scripture comes out of Mark's gospel, the first chapter. I want to focus on verse 24 and 25. Why are you interfering with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus reprimanded him, be quiet and come out of the man, he ordered. God's word that is inspired to help us to be inspired to do a work for him. Let's pray. Father, we ask that the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart would be acceptable in thy sight. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Today I want to share with you a message that I have entitled that comes straight from the scriptures. It says, be quiet and come out. Be quiet and come out. Our text on today begins to let us see that Jesus is now at this uh, region of Capernaum. Capernaum was a seaport city that we find out that that's where he called his first four disciples. He called those brothers of James and John and, and Simon, Peter and Andrew. They were all fishermen. They were out doing their work in a boat. And we find out Capernaum is the place for that to happen. It was in Capernaum where you will find out that it was a city that many people dealt with so much industry and the industry that they were dealing with was the fishing industry. You know, it makes so much sense uh, for Jesus when he goes about looking for his disciples to find at least those who are doing the work that he wants them to do. Not only catch fish, but reach out and catch humanity. You know, in today's lesson, as we begin to see from this passage, talks about how Jesus and this region that he is in, they begin to do the work to help them to catch people, to bring them into the kingdom, to capture their attention, for them to know that God loves them and God intimately cares about every aspect of our life. And in the setting of our text today, we find it that Jesus is now having a dialogue and he is exchanging and he's doing something that is so very different in this gospel, according to Mark, which is so uh, contrary to in Luke. And Luke, it begins to let us see that as Jesus begins his message and it is believed uh, that when he speaks out of Luke, he's quoting out of Isaiah, where he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, where it says that's his first sermon. But we know that Jesus frequently went to the temple it just so happens that that was the sermon that was highlighted. We don't know if he gave a homily or gave a message at some other point in time, but we know in this particular passage today, something powerful happens. As Jesus is there in Capernaum, and as he's there teaching, they begin to have dialogue. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes were all there. And as they begin to have dialogue, you couldn't help but think about what was the measure that they use, how they determined what was of God, what was not of God, by which commentary did they use? Well, you know, in our contemporary times, we are so blessed that we have those who've gone on before us, who have given us comments, who've done research, who've done background to tell us a little bit about what's happening. But in this particular setting of the text, we find out that they were all living by an oral tradition. 
there were these two great scholars. Well, in, in Hebrew, they, they have this commentary that they call the Talmud. And in the Talmud, they had these two primary persons, one by the name of Hillel and the other by the name of Shema. We find out that Hillel, he was a little bit more, quote unquote, liberal in his interpretation of how you would do things. Say, for instance, the whole issue of marriage. Hillel believed that uh, you could divorce um, your wife for whatever reason, even if she burnt the breakfast, you could divorce her or simply because she didn't look as beautiful as she used to or simply because of something that you didn't like, you can issue a divorce. But Shema was a little bit different. He said, no, if you made a vow, you must commit to it. You got to stay to it. You got to get in it to stay in it. And so they began to use these two commentaries. They began to use these words out of Talmud to find out what would be the best way to apply scripture and to apply circumstances and situations. Well, here we find out that was something that was so interesting in their day. Whenever a person was plagued with an ailment or a condition, be it physical or be emotional, mental, they felt that it was because of an evil spirit. Well, this was during that era where anytime someone did something that was out of the norm or that wasn't the standard for everybody else, they blamed it all on a spirit. They said there's a spirit that's in the person. Well, in this particular passage, we find out that there is a man who has a condition and the condition oftentimes will cause him to have seizures and that he will go into convulsions and that he would begin to have a very different kind of appearance than what they would know him to be. Whenever we hear about this, we have to ask ourselves the question, is it that in their day when a person was plagued with something mental or physical it was because the devil caused it. It was because of an evil spirit. Well, in our contemporary society, we don't look at it that way. We look at it totally different. And so we must ask ourselves the question, so how does this change in the sight of God or have we changed? Well, whenever we begin to delve into matters such as that, we have to ask ourselves, how do we manage it? How do we handle it? How do we interpret it? Well, when I begin to look at this passage of scripture, it tells me the setting is one of a man that others have been praying for him and they have been asking God to give him relief. But for some reason, the relief was not coming. Now, Jesus happens upon his situation. We know that throughout the biblical history and all the recording of the miracles that Jesus does, nothing is done by accident. It's all by divine providence. Well, this man has been plagued with this condition. It appears for a period of time because others have tried to deal with him, but no one had a remedy for him. And so Jesus addressed the situation with the man. He tells whatever the thing is that's plaguing the man, the spirit come out of him. Well, at Jesus entrance, whatever it was in the man, and it is believed by the text account, it says that it was an evil spirit. When Jesus was approaching, he said, I know who you are. Leave us alone. You know, isn't it amazing? Whenever Jesus is present, the devil wants him not to be around because he knows Jesus genuinely cares for the man and he's looking out for the man's best interests. You know, demonic forces are not looking out for our best interests. They want to destroy us. The Bible tells us the devil comes to kill, to steal and destroy. But Jesus says, I come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And this pericope, this passage, we begin to see how Jesus walks into this situation, a situation that appeared to have been gloom and doom for quite a period of time. The man has been dealing with it for an extended period of time. It could almost be like some of us in our contemporary day. You know how we say people are dealing with their own demons. You know, some of us have many different forces that come against us. Some of us can't kick habits, habits of whatever they may be. I won't begin to enumerate what those habits could be because all of us have different habits. All of us have different phobias. All of us have certain things that might be mental blocks in our minds to keep us from moving forward. Some of us pre-adventure to say could be dealing with unforgiveness, not being able to forgive for someone for something they have done or, or not being able to move forward in a circumstance or situation, not being able to move forward in a relationship, not being able to leave things behind and press towards the mark of the prize. Well, this man was plagued with something, whatever it was, it seemingly had control of him. How could it be that this man who has all these people who've been praying for him is still dealing with this ailment? Well, Jesus comes on the scene. 
And you know, the good thing I love about whenever Jesus comes on the scene, no life can ever be the same. Jesus sees the man. He uh, quickly begins to assess the situation and he says to the spirit, be quiet and come out of him. Notice what Jesus says first. He says, be quiet. You know, that means I'm not going to have an exchange with you. You know, too often times in our lives, we start to have conversations with the devil. That's how he gets our mind. Too often times we start to have conversations with demonic and evil forces. That's how they begin to take over our bodies. But Jesus tells this force, be quiet. I don't want to hear a word of what you have to say. You know, in all of our lives, I think there should come a point in time that we have to say, be quiet. I am not going to listen to that. You know, we must remind ourselves that the battleground with the devil is in the mind. He's first of all, he tries to plant an idea. He tries to give you a thought. He tries to make you think of something that will cause you go down a road that you really don't want to travel. You know, the devil and all of his devices are always distracting. They're the things that get us off of our course to make us go down a tangent, to make us take a detour, make us take a side road, cause us to have a pit stop. You know, we must remind ourselves that the battleground could be in the mind. Jesus does something so powerful. The demons are beginning to speak and Jesus tells them, be quiet. We must say, be quiet to all of those demonic forces that are in our world today. We have to see, be quiet to all the many different voices that we hear in the world that tries to elevate things above than um, higher than God, tries to elevate things that are a tangent above the real situation. We must focus on what's so important. Jesus tells this demon, be quiet. I am not going to engage in that kind of conversation with you. You know, too oftentimes we get in trouble by trying to negotiate with the devil. Well, you know, there should not be a conversation with the devil. It should be, I'm not going to listen to you. And so don't even try to speak. Be quiet in the name of Jesus. You know, the Bible tells us there's power in the name of Jesus, because at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow, every tongue must confess. Every demon realizes the power of Jesus because Jesus defeated the devil at Calvary's cross and he arose victorious in the text. The demon tries to speak. Jesus says, be quiet. I don't want to hear a word. No one is going to listen to you. You know, wouldn't it be great if we said be quiet to all of those voices that tries to tell our young people you can't make it. Be quiet to all those forces that tries to tell us that you cannot live a successful Christian life. Be quiet to all those forces to try to tell us that marriages don't work, be quiet. To all those forces that try to tell us that you'll never turn out to be anything, be quiet. Be quiet to all of those forces that tries to come against the children of God, the people of God, to tell them that you're something different than what God called you to be. Well, Jesus first says, be quiet. Then secondly, he says, come out of the man. You know, it is important for us to call that thing out by name and say, come out. Jesus says, come out of him right now. You are there for the purpose of harming. You are there for the purpose of bringing about diabolical deeds. You are there for the purpose of trying to make sure that he's never successful and never moves on in life. We must tell those forces that try to come into our minds, come out. Those forces that try to come into our spirit, come out. You cannot live there. Because where Jesus dwells, there's no room for anything else. That's the reason why we as believers, we must have the infilling of God's spirit. We must have so much of God in us that there's no room for anything else. And you know, the way we do that is by studying the word of God, by not only studying, but also reading and having our time of prayer with God to make sure that we are listening to the voice of the Lord. You know, God speaks to us always. But the question comes by what standard do we measure his voice? You know, the only way we can hear the voice of the Lord is to know his voice. And the way we know his voice by being one of his children, because Jesus says, all my sheep know my voice and they follow me whenever I call. It's important for us to know the voice of God. So we find out in the passage that Jesus says, be quiet. Secondly, he says, come out of him. In essence, Jesus knew that this spirit was not there for the good of this man, but for his detriment. 
we must make sure in our community and our world we say come out those forces we must tell them you have to get out you can no longer plague our communities you can no longer plague our children our children that go to school we need to tell those forces come out you no longer can have our children's minds we're going to have them focus on learning you must come out those forces that try to tell our older and our senior adults that no one needs you anymore yes you're valuable those voices that try to tell you that I am here to bring you down, to take you out. But God says, I want you to have life. In this passage, we find out that Jesus is looking for the well-being of this man, also for the community. Now, notice the community, when they see what happens, they says, who is this man? He teaches and preaches with authority, not like the Sadducees, the Pharisees and the scribes. Well, you see, the Sadducees, the Pharisees and the scribes, they were just going on ritualistic practice. They wanted to make sure that they said everything the right way, did everything the right way to make sure that they had the perfect commentary, to make sure that they were grammatically correct, to make sure that they taught as a teacher would by way of pedagogy, but not having power. Jesus taught them the word of God because he was the word of God manifest and he did it with power. He says that I want you to know that I love you. That's what Jesus is demonstrating in this text. I love you so much that I want to make sure that mentally you're taken care of, that physically you're taken care of. You know, it's always in the month of January that we must ask ourselves, are we taking care of our bodies as well as our minds and our spirits? You know, God made us three dimensional. He made us with a body. We must take care of our bodies to make sure that they have the proper nourishment, that they have the proper rest, that they have the proper exercise. We must take care of our minds to make sure that we put the right things in our mind. The Bible tells us in Colossians, set your affections, your minds, your thoughts on things above, not on things of the earth. The Bible tells us in Romans that we must renew our minds by reading the word of God. The Bible begins to tell us how God wants us to be balanced physically. He wants us to be battled mentally and he wants to be bad. He wants us to be balanced emotionally. In the text, Jesus is looking for the man to exercise full wholeness. That's the reason why he speaks to his physical situation and he speaks to his spiritual situation. Today, God wants to speak to your physical and your spiritual situation. He wants us to make sure that we're taking care of our bodies because a healthy body allows us to have a healthy mind, which allows us to have a healthy spirit. And all of the three working together in tandem, it helps us to become the people that God would call us to be. Well, Jesus wants to make sure that this man knows there will no longer be anything tormenting your body nor your mind. And now you're clean on the inside as well as on the out. Well, Jesus does something so powerful in this text. He speaks to the total issues of this man. You know, scripture wants to speak to the total issues of all of us. Jesus wants to speak to us in totality. He wants to make sure that we have soundness of mind, that we have tranquility of spirit, and our bodies are in harmony, doing what God would have them to do, all functioning together for the purpose of glorifying God. You know, today I wanna to challenge you. Have we allowed Jesus to look at our situations and speak to it? Have we allowed him to call out those things that need to be eradicated, eliminated from our lives, from our minds, from our spirits? Too often times we don't get in the presence of Jesus. Well, the only way this man can have Jesus to speak to his situation, he had to be in his presence. You know, today I want to challenge you as I challenge myself as we're coming to the end of this month of January. Let's challenge ourselves to be in the presence of God so God can see our situation. He can speak to it and call it what it is and give us just what we need. The healing mentally, the healing spiritually and the healing physically. Well, in the text, we find out that the man is now made whole. Jesus does something so powerful because everyone says we have never seen such teaching and authority like this before. And after this happens, they go and spread the message to everybody. You know, that's what happens when we get ourselves in the right relationship with God. When God does the work that needs to be done in our minds, our bodies and our spirits, everybody can take notice. Everybody noticed the man a little bit differently. They didn't say that's the man who goes into convulsions. They didn't say that's the man who falls out. 
But they said, that's the man that Jesus has made whole. You know, God wants to do that in your life and in my life. He wants to make us whole. He wants to make sure that all of those impurities, he wants to make sure that all of those things in our lives that need to be taken away are gone. You know, I love the words of that great songwriter. He said, it's all God, it's God, it's all God. You know, when we allow Christ to become Lord of our lives, all the things, all of the hurts, all the things of the past can be gone when we surrender them to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, please hear me very clearly. It doesn't mean that it's gonna be easy. It's gonna be some work, but God wants to do the work with us if we'll only surrender to him. I wanna conclude with the words of a great song that means so much to me. A song that said, I surrender all, I give you all. I give myself away. Lord, I surrender, I give it all to you. Today, I wanna encourage you. If you're facing a challenging situation or circumstance, surrender it to God. Give it all to him. Don't hold back. You know, too often times in this world, we hold back on stuff as opposed to releasing it all and say, God, I'm going to let it go. I love to use the analogy of releasing it and letting it go. It's almost like what you would do with a dove or with a pigeon. You take it out of the cage, you hold it in your hand, and then you release it. And when you release it, it flies away. God wants us to be so free that we can be free in him. The Bible says, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. All we have to do is according to God's word, confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. According to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone be in Christ, that new creature, all things have passed away and old, old things have passed away and all things have become new. You can be a new creature in Christ if you just totally surrender to God. Jesus tells us all we have to do is confess him. All we have to do is believe in his word. All you have to do is say, Father, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and save me. I surrender all to you. I give you my mind. I give you my body. I give you my soul, my spirit. Make me into the person that you would have me to be. He did it for the man in the text. He'll do it for you as well because God is not a respecter of persons. Then if you've done that, email us and let us know that you have joined the believers in Christ. All you have to do is email us at join at the fountain of Raleigh.org and let us know that you'd like to grow in your faith. We'll be happy to help you with that. And if you'd like for us to pray with you and pray for you, email us at prayer at the fountain of Raleigh.org. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. And we want to offer your petitions, your prayers up to God because God listens and he hears to the prayers of all of his children. And today I want to pray with you as we conclude our time. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that you teach us that it is important for us to know that you teach with power and authority. Father, we thank you that you've told those situations in our lives that tried to plague us to be quiet and come out of us. We thank you for pulling out of us those things that need to be removed. We thank you for spiritually performing a surgery to eliminate the things that get between us and you. Now, Father, we thank you for healing. And we know healing sometimes takes time. And we give you all the time of our lives. We surrender our all to you. So, Father, thank you for doing it. And we'll be so careful to give you the praise. Now unto him, the great shepherd who gave his life for the sheep. May the Lord bless, preserve and keep you from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. May he bless you in your leisure, your labor, your joys and your sorrows and give you bright hope for today as well as tomorrow. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. You might still have time, and I hope you do. Come on and join us for our in-person worship service here at The Fountain at 9621 Six Forks Road, where we believe God's blessings never stop flowing, not just here inside, but they are always flowing in all of our lives. And I hope you will feel the overflow of God's blessings with you. Take the Lord with you everywhere you go, and we look forward to you sharing with us with our in-person worship service here at The Fountain at 9 o'clock a.m. this morning. We'll see you then. To sow a seed to the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship, visit our newly redesigned website, thefountainofraleigh.org, and select Sow a Seed from the homepage. Also, giving has been made easier with the new Fountain of Raleigh app, available now in the Apple App Store and Google Play Store. Download today, select Giving from the main menu, and then follow the directions to complete your giving through Subsplash. 
Thank you so very much for all of your gifts and donations that you've given to the Fountain of Raleigh Fellowship. We thank you for what you've done in the past, what you're currently doing, and what you will do in the future. Your gifts and donations helps us to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, not only locally, but throughout the world. Thank you again for your gifts, and may God continue to richly bless you. It is here at the Fountain that we believe that we are exceedingly and abundantly blessed, and may you receive those blessings that God has in store for you. Yeah.